Muhammad's followers have been taught that Muhammad's religion somehow has something to do with the Old Covenant law. This, even though after the Hijra, Muhammad switched the Qibla, or direction that his followers were to pray, from Jerusalem to the Quraysh pagans Kaaba in Mecca. He even switched his holy day from the Sabbath to Friday after the Hijra. So it should be painfully obvious that Muslims do not keep the law when they don't even keep the Sabbath, but rather follow Muhammad's standalone law. Some Muslims even try to suggest that their daily religious routine is rooted in scripture through such giant leaps as to suggest that because there is an instance in the gospel of Jesus prostrating himself, that it somehow means that Yahweh's people are supposed to prostrate ourselves toward the Quraysh's black stone idol in the Kaaba in Mecca five times a day. The reason that Jews and Christians don't prostrate ourselves in prayer is, of course, because there is no such ordinance in Scripture that instructs us to. Indeed, Christians are instructed to pray without ceasing. That describes continuous contact in a relationship with God by way of His Spirit in us as directly opposed to monotonous empty ritual. Indeed, we are also instructed specifically how not to pray. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as a heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking, which aptly describes Muhammad's Salat. Nor are there ordinances that instruct Yahweh's people to perform ablution before prayer. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said that cleanliness is one half of faith. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, The key to paradise is prayer, and the key to prayer is cleanliness, ablution. It is reported that when Al-Hassan, the son of Ali, prayed, he would wear his best clothes. When he was asked about this, he said, Verily, Allah is beautiful, and he loves beauty, so I beautify myself for my Lord. One of the three things Muhammad, peace be upon him, loved was perfume. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, Allah does not accept the prayer of one who has nullified his ablution until he performs it again. If one of Muhammad's followers so much as passes gas after performing ablution, Muhammad's Allah will not hear his prayer unless and until he performs the ablution all over again. Nor is there an ordinance for Jews and Christians to travel to a location in the southwest Arabian desert, 1,200 kilometers away from the holy land of the patriarchs and prophets, where Yahweh had his people build his temple, to engage in thinly repackaged Quraysh pagan rituals around the Quraysh's black stone idol in their Kaaba, let alone wear long white robes while doing so. The historical and Islamic records do confirm that the Quraysh pagans engaged in twaf or circumambulation of the Kaaba seven times in Arabian moon, sun, and star worship. They also performed the Sayyid of al Saf and al Marwa in Arabian jinn demon worship. Their rituals at Arafa and Mina, casting stones, sacrificing animals, and much more were thinly repackaged by Muhammad and are still practiced by his followers today. One doesn't really have to dwell on the true origins of Islamic rituals since there is no historical or archaeological evidence that suggests that Mecca ever existed before the 4th century AD or its Kaaba before the early 5th century when immigrants from Yemen built it. Please see the videos on the history of Mecca and Abraham, Hagar, Paran, and Ishmael by clicking on the video annotation links at the end of this video. Nor is there an ordinance for Jews or Christians to fast for 30 days, beginning with the sighting of a crescent moon, which is why we don't. So where did Muhammad come up with Islamic routines? Muhammad claimed he got the instructions regarding praying five times a day when he rode on a flying animal from Mecca to Jerusalem to Paradise and back to Mecca one night. But then he also claimed to have entered and prayed in a temple in Jerusalem on that trip, that history tells us have been torn down over 500 years prior to his claim. Not surprisingly, there were no witnesses of Muhammad's fanciful flying steed. However, four of Muhammad's relatives did found a local sect of the second century monotheistic occult cult of the Sabians that they named Anath, 
Indeed, Muhammad mentioned Sabians right alongside Christians and Jews in the Quran. Muhammad became so deeply involved in the second century occult cult that the locals sometimes referred to him simply as a Sabian. First language Arabic speaking Dr. Rafa Amari included original source material in his 20 year full time study of Islam in Arabia. According to his paper, Ramadan and its Roots, the Sabians, who were pagans in the Middle East, were identified with two groups, the Mandanians and the Haranians. Ibn al-Nadim wrote in his book al farisit about various religious sects in the Middle East. He says, in the month which the Haranians fasted for 30 days, they honored the god Sin, which is the moon. Al-Nadim described the feasts they celebrated and the sacrifices they presented to the moon. So it would seem no coincidence that Ramadan begins with the observation of a crescent moon. Regarding feasts, it's interesting to note that some online Muslims confess that Muslims spend more money on food during the month that they fast than any other month of the year, because they feast on fancier fare than normal before dawn and after sunset. Dr. Amari continues, Another historian, Ibn Abi Zanad, also speaks about the Haranians saying that they fast for 30 days, they look toward Yemen when they fast, and they pray five times a day. We know that Muslims also pray five times a day. Haranian fasting is also similar to that of Ramadan in Islam in the fact that they fast before the sun rises until the sun set, just as the Muslims do during the days of Ramadan. Still another historian, Ibn al-Jizi, described the Haranian fasting during this month. He said they concluded their fasting by sacrificing animals and presenting alms to the poor. We also find these things in Islamic fasting today. The pagan Arabians in the pre-Islamic Jalia period fasted in the same way Muslims fasted, as originally directed by Muhammad. Pagan Arabian fasting included abstinence from food, water, and sexual contact, the same as practiced by Islam. So the Sabians prayed five times a day, performed ablution, prostrated while praying, fasted for 30 days in observance of the moon, and wore long white robes. In occultism in the family of Muhammad, Dr. Amari wrote, Khadijah, the first wife of Muhammad, came from a family of prominent occult leaders. Among them was Rukiyai, a cannonade of jinn devils at Mecca. Rukiyai was a sister of Waraka ben Nafal, the Ebionite occult priest who was a cousin of Khadijah. Waraka was a leading figure in the Anab. That's the Mecca sect of the Sabians. He used to make tanuf, which meant he spent times in the cave of Hara, separating himself from the rest of society for months at a time. Such practices were common among heretics, as we learn from early Christian fathers, and were known among leaders of occult sects. Karaja used to make tanuf in the same caves. Waraka was the one who convinced Muhammad to be a prophet. After returning home from the cave of Hara, where he often went, Muhammad was frightened. He told his wife that a spirit claiming to be Gabriel appeared to him and choked him three times. Muhammad was convinced after this encounter that he had a devil inside of him. But Khadijah insisted that Muhammad become a prophet of Allah. It's interesting to note that when angels appeared in the Bible, they never threatened anyone or imposed a prophetic role upon them. Khadija was married to Nabash bin Waqdan, a visionary for the jinn, before she met Muhammad. The jinn appeared to Nabash in the form of an old man to give him information. Abu Bakr was his most important disciple of Nabash. Abu Bakr remained a close friend of Khadija, eager to obey her when she declared Muhammad was a prophet instead of her former husband. As a wife of a visionary jinn, this gave Khadija some prestige because many Arabians consulted jinn visionaries and gave them money. This also explains why Khadijah was wealthy. She had caravans which brought goods from Syria to Mecca. After Nabash died, she employed Muhammad in her caravans and then married him, although Muhammad was 20 years younger than she. After the negative experiences which depressed Muhammad, 
Kata just sent him to her cousin Waraka to convince him that Muhammad was called to be a prophet of Allah. Waraka succeeded in his task and became responsible for most of the Quranic verses at the beginning. Waraka inserted Ebionite doctrines about Jesus in the Quran, stating that Jesus was a prophet and that he was not crucified, but God made someone to resemble Jesus. That one was crucified because a crowd thought he was Jesus. This doctrine was first initiated by Simon, the magician from Samaria, who later founded a heresy which took his name, Simonianism. In reality, Simon created the root for such doctrine before it was developed by the Gnostics in later times. Dr. Amari's paper, Occultism in the Family of Muhammad, from which these quotes were lifted, is available at the second link on this video, and Ramadan and its roots at the third. So which is more likely, that Muhammad picked up the rituals that his followers engage in from conversing with Adam, Moses, Abraham, and others while riding around on a flying animal one night, or that he simply lifted them from the second century occult cult of the Sabians, which had been deeply involved in by way of four of his relatives? What seems to have been increasingly revealed here in regard to Muhammad's followers? Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise, are counted for the seed. Considering Muhammad's encounter with the spirit in that cave in Hurrah, it should come as no surprise that Muhammad declared the exact opposite of the whole subject of the gospel, which is the crucifixion, death, and resurrection of the Messiah, to save all from sin who have faith in the shed blood of the Lamb of God. The Old Testament, as well as Jesus himself, prophesied his crucifixion, death, and resurrection. And Jesus took the twelve disciples and said unto them, Behold, the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests, and they shall condemn him to death, and to scourge, and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And Mohammed? They said, We killed Christ Jesus, but they killed him not, nor crucified him. For of a surety they killed him not. The exact opposite. In addition to the overwhelming historical and archaeological evidence against Islam, as well as geographical absurdity regarding Abraham suggested by Islamic so-called tradition that is a work of pure fiction created in the 7th and 8th centuries that masquerades as thousands of years of pre-Muhammad history penned without reference to historical record from before the 6th century AD. Yet some of Muhammad's followers will still continue to reject the gospel of the Messiah to follow Muhammad because of the spirit within them. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. They say, Allah most gracious has begotten a Son. Indeed ye have put forth a thing most monstrous. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son the same hath not the Father. Please click on the video links appearing on the screen for much more. For text version and discussion, please click on the first link in the drop-down menu that includes links to many other resources as well. Make no mistake, one must choose between the 1600-year record of Yahweh to mankind as revealed through all of his prophets and witnesses that his people have followed through two covenants for 3,500 years, or the exact opposite of the whole subject of the gospel through Muhammad and his self-serving alter ego, Allah, through his standalone, heavily abrogated, 23-year, 7th century record. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you.